Hi, I'm Carter Sinclair, vocational deacon at Emmanuel Episcopal Church in Virginia Beach. I've enjoyed this series immensely, and it's kind of hard for me to follow all the excellent theologians who have come before me in this series. So, talking about tough passages of the Bible, I'm not really going to talk about a tough passage, more, maybe let's call it tough history of the Bible. And we're going to talk about the birth narrative of Jesus. You might think, what's hard about that? Well, hopefully I'll explain it to you as we go along. We all know the birth narrative of Jesus as we've seen it in the Christmas pageant ever since we were little. The angel Gabriel appears to Mary, tells Mary that she's going to have a baby and to name him Jesus. And then Joseph travels with Mary to Bethlehem because there is a decree by Caesar Augustus that they need to travel there because of taxation. When they get there, there's no room in the inn, so they're forced to go into the manger. Mary has Jesus in the manger. The shepherds appear being called by the angels while they're tending their flocks out in the fields. And then a little bit later, the wise men show up bearing gifts for the baby Jesus. So that is basically, I think, the birth narrative that most of us know and are familiar with. Now, most of that birth narrative does come from the Gospel of Luke. However, there is a little bit of the Gospel of Matthew mixed in there, specifically the wise men. So, what's hard about this? Well, the birth narrative is only in two of the Gospels. It is only in Matthew and Luke. It is not in Mark or John. So, I'm going to read to you the birth narrative that is in Matthew. Now, the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So right now we have the angel actually appearing to Joseph, which is different from the pageants that we see or the version from Luke. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. So the direction in this part is taking place from Joseph. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is a child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and we have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened in all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them that the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. When you have found him, bring him word, so that he may also go and pay him homage. And I'm going to skip down a little bit. 
with the wise men. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up and took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. I'm going to skip down a little bit further. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life were dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on some imaginary glasses, but they're going to be the lens of the modern Western world. And when I put that lens on and I look and I compare Matthew and Luke, the birth narratives are totally different. So, if I analyze it, I would say, they don't agree at all. Maybe one is true and the other is false. Maybe they're both false. How do I get by what I call this hard part of the Bible? Well, there's two things that come to me. One is the words of Joseph Campbell that I've come to live by a lot. And that is miss are much truer than facts. And too often times in the Western modern world we want to look at facts and we aren't careful to look at the myths. And then let's go back and try to look at who was Matthew writing to and who was Luke writing to. Matthew, scholars say, was probably writing to a group of Jews in Antioch who were basically being kicked out of the synagogue. They were being uh, estranged from the synagogue. They were be, being told by being followers of Jesus that they were not good, faithful Jews anymore. So you notice a lot of what Matthew says in his birth narrative is saying that the prophecies of old have been fulfilled. Then what I think is even more interested is Joseph becomes this key figure in the birth narrative in Matthew. Joseph, think about the other person in the Old Testament, in the Jewish scriptures, Joseph. Joseph, the one who went into, he went into Egypt who had the dreams, and Joseph of the New Testament is just like Joseph of the Hebrew Scriptures. He has the dreams. He goes into Egypt. And what is Jesus like when he comes back? He comes back out of Egypt. He is like Moses. So Matthew is very much reinforcing that Jesus is the fulfilling of the prophecies. Jesus is the Messiah. He's speaking to his people who are concerned. Are we going down the right path? Are we following? Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? And then you look at Luke. Remember, early in Luke, you have Elizabeth, and Zechariah, who are the parents of, of John. And they're the cousin of Jesus. 
and they're associated with the temple. So Luke is going to be more along that line. Luke is going to be maybe more in terms of a, of a temple people. Luke is going to, I don't know how to say it other than potentially be more potentially Jewish in terms of the temple is still important. So when I look at it with my Western eyes, I find that they don't agree. But when I try to go back in time and look at it with my mythical eyes, I see that there is a lot of meaning in both of them. I see that in Luke, you have the shepherds, you have the angel Gabriel, you have, you have all that is saying Jesus is here, Jesus is to save the world. Mary, you are going to be the mother of God. Do not fear. M Mary, Mary, do not worry. In Matthew, you're going to have the wise men who are not Jewish, but who are bringing gifts because Jesus and Matthew is going to be more of the international type person. Jesus is going to be more worldwide. And that leads me to how do we perceive things? And one of the, one of the things I have behind me is a painting of a Madonna and child. And it reminds me of when I was actually in Bethlehem, in the house of Mary, or the shrine for the house of Mary. And one of the most powerful things to me at that time, from each nation across the world, they all submitted their vision of Mary. And as you can imagine, their vision of Mary varied for where that came from. So I doubt that Mary was blonde-haired, blue-eyed, Jesus was a blue-eyed son. But to me, this is representative of a Madonna and the child. And so as we enter or get close to the Advent season, one of the things to think about when we look at maybe stories in the Bible that in Western eyes or with the Western lens on, don't actually agree with each other. There is so much more deeper meaning in this. The, the stories were told to the people and we have to remember what context they were told in. We have to remember who the audience was and we have to look for the deeper meaning. So as we approach the Advent season, sometimes we have to take off our Western lens and we have to go back into the time of Jesus. We have to go back when it was amazing that this small child born in a backwater town in the middle of nowhere in the Roman Empire came for all of humankind, came for all of us, and was born. We might have a different birth narrative in one gospel than we do in the other gospel, but Jesus was sent here for the universal language to bring us all together. And so hopefully that might help you take off your Western lens for a little bit and see the Gospels for what they were meant to be. Amen.